the origin and the formation of soil samples. So this is uh, what we have already covered uh, last week partially on the uh, weathering process. So last week we covered a little bit about how weathering happens through water and also air, but today we're going to learn in details about the uh, soil forming process, which is in, uh, which is related to the uh, weathering process as well. And uh, to be specific, we're going to learn the details about this uh, soil formation equation. So last week we have like uh, seen this formula before, and it is affected by the five uh, soil forming factors. So these are the five factors that will be uh, will will be discussed in detail today. So just to uh, recap, what are those five factors? Number one, CL means climate. So in terms of climate, there are temperature and moisture. For O, that means organism, which is the factors influenced by the uh, biological process that causes this weathering process. So it's either due to plants or maybe microorganism. Number three is about R, the relief. So relief is about the topography, slope and landscape, which is uh, what is the factors that is uh, influenced by the shape or the uh, geography. Yeah. Uh, P, which means parent material. So some materials, they are more susceptible to weathering, some are not. So these are the minerals that will be about to, to be weathered. And then finally, the time. So how long and uh, what what are the fact what what are the uh, the degree of weathering due to the extent due to time? So I have already explained this one. So I'm going to skip. So we go straight to the parent material. So parent material can be divided into two things, which is organic and inorganic. Now. In no way is that the weathering going to happen just to one of these material. It's just based on what kind of soil that you have, uh, that 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 we have, uh, when the weathering begins. So most likely, the weathering process will happen and will begin with the inorganic phase. Because why? Because if you learn, uh, history Earth was formed due to the. Uh, cooling of magma first of all there were no life forms to begin with so most likely the inorganic phase will begin followed by the organic phase when there are like growth of microorganism on top of the uh, inorganic minerals or maybe some moss or plants that happens on on top of it yeah so as you can see the uh, inorganic parameters can be in two groups as well uh, residual or rock or mineral or transported minerals by various agent. So the residual rock will be the first one to begin with due to the cooling of magma. So these rocks also later on, we're going to cover uh, the uh, the one more chapter 1.3 about rocks and minerals. So in there you, you will see why I say some rocks are easier to be weathered, some are not. Um, and then Next one is transported materials by various agents. So the difference okay, of this weathering agent may also give you different degree of weathering because some parent materials, they are more susceptible to one of these agents. I would say if you refer to Malaysia, we have a lot of rain. In fact, right now it's also raining heavily. And uh, just for information, yeah, just for information, Malaysia is actually the second highest in the world in terms of rainfall. So we are the we are the highway second highest. The highest is Papua New Guinea. So you can see that most of the rocks in Malaysia they are weathered by water, and we also learned last week that uh, the weathering also happens through a lot of rocks. For example, limestone. So limestone is very susceptible due to water uh, weathering due to water. So these are to give you one example. Now organic soil materials depends on what kind of uh, plants that you have <coughs> originally. And uh, usually this kind of organic soil deposited in wet areas. Okay, 
just one more information. Not only these organic soil materials are deposited in wet area, they are also deposited in cold area. So, I mean, regions such as Cameron Highlands, as you have planned to do your, uh, your assignment, those are the areas that is expected to have high organic matter because they have high rainfall, they have a lot of moisture in their soil, and they're also cool. So that encourages the, uh, the accumulation of organic materials in the soil. So the residual parent material, this is a minimum runoff transport. The rate of uh, formation is often slow and the soil appears to be directly from bedrock. Uh, <clears throat> now, not much of it, I can, I can explain about this residual soil. Now, this is due to the, uh, the result, I would say, the result of weathering of parent material. So you will, you will see a few exp uh, examples lah, yeah, after this. And these are the examples. So as a result of weathering of bedrock, so these are the uh, results from water weathering. So it could be due to lacustrine, lacustrine, which is deposited in lake. So lake also may have some current movement and that also causes these uh, uh, parent materials to be deposited. Now the most famous or the most common one in Malaysia is the alluvial or fluvial, which is deposited near the river or streams. And why this is so uh, important in Malaysia? Because without alluvial soil, there will be no tin mining in Malaysia. And for your information, most of the tin that you have learned in geography before, the tin mining that we've learned, there are the softer side of it in which this tin ore, this tin minerals, they are actually from the hills. They are actually trapped in the hard rocks in the hills. And due to this alluvial, uh, alluvial soil, as a result of uh, water weathering, they were transported into lowlands near, for example, Lembah Kinta. Lembah Kinta, as you know, in, in geography has a lot of uh, tin mining happens before that. And why, and why they happen in, 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 so, in, in so many ways is because these tins, they are in the soft soil of alluvium near Lembakinta last time. Yeah. So these are the important factors. Lah, yeah? And also the marine transported materials, which is deposited near the ocean, uh, near the ocean, lah, which is near the seaside. But most likely this marine, uh, this marine parent materials will be located near the river or the seaside. River is most important lah, because river is the uh, is also contributed due to alluvial deposit as well. So I'm going to go pretty fast after this and show you a few examples of alluvial deposit, which is the location where you can find all these things. Uh, the example of paramaterials being deposited due to alluvium. So examples such as floodplains, alluvial fat, and also delta. Floodplains is well, you can see usually in uh, in delta, usually it's not just in river, but usually in delta. Now it happens due to flooding in which flooding carries a lot of sediments from the uh, alluvium and they also deposited due to the slowing down of river water. Uh, I'm going to skip all this point and show you straight away how this happens. So you can see in the uplands, you have small, small river. These are the source of all those rock weathering and they carry all those small particles like clay down to lowlands. And when you look at the flood place, you can see that these are the lowland area nearer to the larger uh, rivers. And usually these are the areas that you can say quite fertile because why it carries all the nutrients which is leached down from uplands and with that they carry also a lot of sediments now these sediments could be uh, as small as silt or maybe clay but you know the idea is this so these are the materials that will be deposited near the valley and the silt and clay carries a lot of nutrient now alluvial fence actually is near to the river as well but uh, the shape of it is quite intriguing. And I would say this alluvial fence usually you can see near Delta. Uh, no, Valley, I would say, Valley, sorry. Valley and is near to the, uh, the, the meeting point between lowlands and highlands. 
such as what you can see right here. Uh, you can see that maybe uh, the extension of this alluvial fan, you probably can see a big river that connected to these small, small channels uh, of alluvial fans. And as usual, just like the uh, floodplains, uh, apart from the uh, flooding, now most of these alluvial fans, the small particles, they are carried from highlands due to rock weathering down to the lowlands area. So immediately after this meeting point between highlands and lowlands, you can find that the flow of water that carries all the sediment suddenly slows down. And that is where all these heavier sediments, the bigger and heavier sediments like silt, they stop moving and they're deposited near the alluvial fans. And the shape of it, you can see it's very much like a fan. Okay. And again, now uh, these alluvial fans, apart from being fertile, they're also probably, okay, it depends on what is in the parent rock because uh, some of this parent rock, they have uh, precious mineral, like the one in Lebakinta, they have tin. So that is why in Lebakinta, this kind of area, somewhere near Ipoh, you can find that I mean, last time there were so many tin ores that they have like a thriving mineral mining that uh, mineral mineral mining industry and it still is because uh, uh actually ipo ipo said to be like having no not not much of uh, tin uh, uh, already but it has developed i'm referring to a lot of places that they have like such a geography and they were having still having some mining activities depending on what kind of mineral that you're looking after yeah. And then delta bed deposit, I will uh, skip lah, yeah, because most of the points they are very similar to floodplains and also alluvial fans. And you can see here delta. It seems like the land is extruding out. Well, it is not because this is this, this is due to the gradual and slow movement of sediments uh, from uh, from the highlands, and then they are flowing down due to weathering. And then once they are coming to the meeting point between the land and also the ocean, you can see that suddenly the ocean current starting to push back and slows down the flow of river water. That is where you can see most of the sediment, they stop moving and they poop, drop down. And then that is where they are deposited. And slowly it will develop into a land mass. And this is what we call delta. And once again, as you learn in geography, delta very fertile. So far, not much of uh, mining activities and uh, that is I mean this is because even though Delta they are very fertile they have like one common problem you see, if you if you still remember what I said just now they were deposits of fine particles like clay and silk so usually this kind of area is not known to have a very strong physical structure so houses probably is not suitable to be built here because of the soft soil and not only that they are too fertile sometimes they are like mangrove forests so you know mangrove forests and also like recently happened like last week I pasang besar you know what that means that means a uh, sudden rise in uh, what they say I pasang in, in English I forgot but you know like I pasang yeah in Bahasa Melayu in English if not mistaken is called ah if I remember, I'll tell you later. Yeah. So suddenly the sea level rises due to uh, some, some certain factors. So most of the time, this area, they are just left as mangrove forests. Yeah. And it's not much of like activities for human. Okay. Gravity transported material like colovium. Now this is without water, but due to the uh, uh, effect of gravity. And because of that, most of the rock particles that is from the highlands, they tend to fall down. But before they fall down, they also causes a bit of abrasion. When they fall down, when they hit a certain other surface, they will also cause abrasion and breaking up. So that also may, may happen, colovium. Okay, so from larger particles, it will go into like form into smaller particles, just like the uh, uh, weathering due to water movement, uh, but probably not much would compare to the, I mean, the extent of weathering, probably not much as due to the movement of water. Now, these are the examples, as you can see, most of the colluvium uh, weathering 
happens near hillside and whatnot because why you need something that falls down from something very high so it happens near the hillside yeah and as you can see right here the colovium happens near uh, and the result lah, i mean the small particles is located near the foothills where the colovium happens actually from the hilltop and you can see carefully from the hilltop it's mostly rocks which you can say is parent material so things falls down and eventually they roll down and the result of the colluvium erosion sorry the colluvium weathering mostly is located at the foothills yeah the extent of this uh, colluvium weathering in Malaysia probably is not so so not so obvious like, because why we have rainfall almost every day so that's why the alluvium la, is probably what is more applicable in Malaysia. OK, so next part, wind transport. Now, this one also happens in Malaysia because it is very apparent that in the seaside that we're going to have high movement, OK, uh, high wind speed. And that usually happens. La. I mean, most of these wind uh, transported materials is happening in seaside especially into, into the open sea but when you compare this one uh, most of this uh, significant wind transported materials in in terms of the wind cause weathering happens in a vast area like like uh, places like in sahara desert that is one good example anywhere that you can see desert like that is an example of wind transported materials and they have a name for that they call elo 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 Eolian deposit and I think this one we have gone through a lot last week things such as lowest sand these are the result of wind transported materials from wind weathering so I guess I won't going to uh, elaborate so much since last week now in fact this slide we have already seen it last week glacier flower or the other name for it is called lowest and it's uh, located near large, vast areas such as China, uh, US, or maybe the desert area of Australia. These are the examples of lowers. So you can see that land, uh, I mean, like sub, I mean, Sahara Desert, they have a lot of lands. So these are the result of Eolian. Uh, these are the Eolians as a result of wind erosion. Okay, now moving on to the other paramaterial organic deposit. Now, a lot of uh, a lot of us, lah, I would have to say, not realizing the existence of soil material from the organic side. So here, I want to explain a little bit, lah, because why? Uh, I'm I'm quite sure that not many of you know that this is a this is actually called peat. Now, last time you probably have uh, for those for for students who uh, loves to wash. Uh, what is it? Television before this. You probably have learned that we have an oil, palm oil industry that keeps on getting complained and hit by international community. community. And unfortunately, la, the real cause of it was not even mentioned in Malaysian news at all. Not even in television, not even in newspaper. So we from the scientific community, we know exactly what happened. That is because most of the palm oil that you uh, that we are having today, they were grown and produced partly from peat soil. And why this is an issue? I think we will first learn what is peat and then later on I'll tell you what was the problem. Yeah. So peat material. There are four kinds of peat, moss peat, herbaceous peat, woody peat, and sedimentary peat. Now, what kind of uh, peat that you probably ask in Malaysia, they can be said to be more of herbaceous and woody peat. Sedimentary peat maybe also is part of it, but we're talking about inland peat. So this, I mean, the second and the third one probably is more dominant. Because why Malaysia is actually a very old forest area. So why peat exists is because they were gradual deposition of organic material. Now, this organic material mostly coming from trees or vegetation, any plant material that once they die, they will fall down onto the ground 
and then why these plants, this dead plant matter uh, remains in the soil is because they were preserved. So peat are the organic materials from the uh, from the very old plants that were deposited and they're preserved due to the wet nature of the soil. So usually la, when you look at peat soil, they were always most of the time <clears throat> inundated by water or at least the soil will have high moisture content. So with water, they, they can actually preserve the organic material. It's very much the same like uh, the soil in Cameron Highlands, except that this peat soil happens most of the time in lowlands, and not only in lowlands, they are actually located near seaside. So yeah, most of the peat areas in Malaysia, they are like tepi tepi pantai very near to the seaside. And you know why? Because there are like a lot of factors that causes a lot of moisture. And one of them is air pasang. Yeah. I still don't remember what is it. Air pasang in, in, in English. So for those, uh, in, for, for students who can like find in Google, let me know lah, what is air pasang in English. Can't, can't recall what is the name in English. So once again, with high water content, they preserve organic matter, and there you have it, your peat soil. Yeah. So cattails is uh, what usually the plants that is located near the river bed, and these are one of the source of the, uh, what they call peat, because once they deposit near the river bed, so these are one of the materials that increase the organic matter and causes it to turn into peat. Sedges is a, uh, a herbal plants that are like grass and they grow widely everywhere but uh, if they happen to grow near to the uh, soil with high moisture content so they will be preserved and turn into the uh, peats and cattails another example so this is the actual image and I think you probably have seen a lot of this before especially near the uh, Sawapadi kan? And these are the areas where you have a lot of like uh, snails that grow onto this root with a pink color rose. So these are the semi-aquatic plants that grows in wet areas. So they will fall down. So once they fall down, they are the source of the organic material that causes it to turn into peat. Shrub are, are, are small plants that are grown near everywhere. It's not just near the peat area, but you know, I mean, these are the source of organic material of peat soil. So I think these climate factors were going to be like quite pretty quick because I remember last week I've covered a lot about physical, chemical and biological factors. So let's see what we did not cover, then I will cover a little bit. So weathering process happened, physical, chemical and bio biological factors, uh, temperature, wind, air. So we covered that. So I will skip. Uh, chemical weathering. Last time we talked about how acid, uh, the, the, the carbonic acid in the rainwater. So this is one example of the chemical weathering. The other one is the sulfuric acid that happens in some of the soil and it causes hydration, hydrolysis, everything I have covered. So I will skip as well. Uh, moving on, biological weathering. This is caused by plant and microorganism root growth and also acidification reaction, complexation reaction. Okay, now, the root growth, I have already covered that. If you still remember last week, we have I have explained a little bit on the, the trees that happens to grow on the hill slope of a web of a parent material of a rock. So that is one example that I've already covered. So I will skip. Now, acidification is something that I probably did not explain in detail. So as you can see right here, the usual suspect, I would say it, the acidic content in this acidification is caused by carbonic acid. Well, probably from the microorganism, not just carbonic acid, there will be a bit more of the acid, but it's, it's like not as acidic as you think, I would say. Now, for those people, for those students who have background, good background in uh, microbiology, you will learn that a certain microbiology always excrete acidic substance. And I would say this microorganism would be bacteria. 
Now, when bacteria uh, having respiration in, in the soil, they were going to release organic acids uh, such as carbo carboxylic acid. So these are, these are the other source of the acidic condition in the soil. Yeah, and also cause the weathering, of course, because if you still remember, this weathering process happened more significantly for parent material, which is alkaline. Yeah, when acids meets alkaline, they dissolve it. Yeah. So other things such as lichen, green algae. Now, mostly if they are in the uh, in the in the environment where there is a, a abundance of oxygen, when oxidation happens, usually you will see a bit of acid, either as sulfuric acid, organic acid, or whatnot. And all of those they are caused by microbial action, because the oxidation, even though it can happen naturally, it will cause and it will be accelerated by the oxidation of microbes. Yeah. So complexation. Now, for those students who are just beginning this semester, or I think you have already learned complexation before in general chemistry. Uh, complexation is, like I said to you just now, it's due to a chemical reaction that happens between these acids and also metals, the metal ions from the mineral or the parent, parent, parent material. Now, complexation is actually means this functional group, carboxyl group or carboxylate to be more precise. The carboxylate group is a group where without hydrogen and it carries a negative charge, you see, why carboxylate is more apparent? Because with negative charge, it is easily attracted to the ions and the aluminium that exist in the liquid as cation. So you have negative charge and positive charge. Therefore, they attract. When they attract, several more of this carboxylate group also attracted. There you have it. You have a complexation. Complexation just simply means there are a lot of these organic, small organic, uh, organic compounds. They are attached to this uh, metal and they form strong bonds. So once this complexation happens, they will pull this iron away, weakens the parent material, and that also going to they're going to cause chemical weathering as well. So today we add two more apart from the acid base neutralization that we've learned last week. Yeah. Okay, relief <clears throat> now. When I talk about relief, it's mostly due to the shape of the earth or what we call in topography. So there are three factors, the aspect, the slope and the curvature. Uh, probably not too uh, familiar with the word aspect, but later I'll explain later. Slope, I'm sure you know what is slope, Cherun in Basim Layun. Curvature is how curvy is the, because sometimes the, it, it curves in so many ways. Yeah. So. What is aspect? So here it is, the orientation of the soil. Uh, because it influences the amount of solar radiation that the soil receives and also the temperature. So last time when we learned about climate, if you still remember when it gets very hot and then it gets very cold, the, the rocks in the area probably were going to break apart much more faster than the one that is not having difference, big difference in terms of changes of temperature. So receiving sunlight also helps in uh, in increasing the weathering, such as what you can see right here. If it facing the sun, it warms the soil. Not only it warms it, but it also dries it. So if it dries it, that means the organic matter uh, is not much. Uh, probably not much of organic matter if it's too dry, but it's just right, maybe you have enough organic matter. So there is a very subjective, la, the, the, the definition of sun facing slope. I would say for slope that is facing sun and it gets too hot with no moisture, probably that is the area that you're going to have more uh, erosion or weathering. So it depends also, yeah? But you know, like, when you have sun, you have more temperature. It depends on how high the temperature gets before you. Uh, it affects the uh, weathering process. Yeah. So the slope, as you can see, <clears throat> the higher the slope, the steeper the slope, the more erosion or the more weathering it will going to happen. Pretty straightforward, so I won't going to stay too long. 
You now, when you look at it, the slope where you have a steeper gradient will tend to have less material being deposited because what not? When they are very slopey, they just follow the direction of the water flow. And when it comes to an area with no steepness, then they start slow down and this is where you deposit all the soils. Lah. So this is where I have it, A1, A2. Now these are what we call the horizon. Later you will see it later. Yeah. Slope and curvature. So it determines how well moisture can be retained. As you've learned just now, with more moisture, you're going to have more vegetation and you have more organic material. So the biota. So this one is the organic factors. Uh, the organism factors of how um, this uh, so-called living organism takes part in soil formation. Uh, it could be due to the accumulation of organic matter from the abundance of moisture plus living organism that stays on top of it. Uh, it could be also due to biochemical or biophysical weathering as what we've learned earlier from the plants that Borrows, uh, borrows into the rock or paramaterial. Uh, profile mixing, nutrient recycling, and nutrient cycling, and also aggregate stability. So time is another factor from the soil weathering process. The longer it goes, the more weathering it we're going to have. So this is uh, what we've learned and explained last week. So I will skip this as well. And as you can see right there, most of the soils that are considered to be uh, well developed are those that have a long history or the long extent of weathering. So most of the soil that have a lot of weathering will tend to have a lot of horizon. So this is what we call a very well developed soil. So they have O, A, E, B, C, R horizon. And these are the uh, horizon. I mean, the, I mean the horizons that you need to remember like, later on. And you can see, usually, to in order to have this much of development or develop horizon, it takes tens or maybe thousands of years, hundreds and thousands of years, in order to have this well developed soil. It takes a lot of time. Okay. So another image that represent that, the time factors in causing the weathering process. Uh, so that is it, all the five factors. So next we're going to go into the soil dynamics. Now what is, what is defined by soil dynamics is, how does the soil particles move around? So don't think that the soil does not move. They can move because after all, if they're small enough, they can be moved by the movement of wind, air weathering, or air erosion, or maybe water erosion as well. So these are the two main agents that can move the soil, and how they move, there are four. Well, actually, there are more, but we're going to explain these four first. Yeah? First one is transformation, next one is translocation, third one is addition, and then the fourth one is losses. So this diagram shows you how it moves around, addition, transform, loss, or addition. Okay, now for the first one, transformation means the soil constituents are chemically or physically modified or destroyed, and others are synthesized from precursor material. Now transformation, you can imagine that like, this is due to the weathering process from larger rock particles, they transform into smaller ones, so this is one example. A lot of transformation can happen either physically or chemically. And you can think of this transformation process as a weathering, a normal weathering process. Lah, you can say that. Okay. But sometimes this transformation also can be caused by microorganism as well. Because when microorganism works, it tends to acidify the soil and it causes some chemical changes. That also may also consider to be a biochemical reaction or transformation as well. Now translocation, as you can see from the word itself, meaning some movement. Okay, so let's see, how does it move? 
translocation involves the movement of inorganic and organic materials laterally, so means up and down laterally, within the horizon of, oh, sorry, laterally means side by side, from left to right or right to left, that is lateral. Within the horizon, that means it happens within one same layer so they move from side to side which is possible but not common because why the one that is common is vertical because why you always have gravity and that is why you have vertical translocation so this vertical translocation happens between two or several horizons up or down so don't think that it's always down although most likely it's going down but sometimes it could also go up due to certain factors, okay? Now, what are the agents is usually water and also gravity. So when water reacts with gravity, one direction, it goes down, but with capillary action. So this is a very strange action because with capillary force, the movement of water is no longer going down, but sometimes it's suspended or maybe it moves up or maybe side by side. So this translocation, uh, majority is due to gravity but a little bit due to capillary action. I hope you know what is capillary action. That is the force between two walls that are narrow enough. These two walls of a capillary force that happens near channels that are small enough. So they were usually suspended and not affected by the gravity of force. So they can move up, down, left, right, anywhere. So the materials move, including dispersed fine clay particles. As you know, the clays, they are small enough. They move through the larger rocks and downwards, maybe side by side, if they come into contact with layers that they are impermeable, they cannot no longer go down. So they'll move along the lines of that impermeable layer, like the underground clay layers, you can, you can say, so they move along that, or maybe dissolve salt. So when they are dissolved due to, for one reason, for example, limestone. Limestone, when they meet with acid, so they dissolve it and this is one example of dissolved salt or dissolved organic substance. Now, organic substance from that matter, uh, that organic matter like leaves, when they dissolve, they tend to produce a liquid transparent but black in, in, in color, either black, brown or yellowish. So these are the uh, dissolved organic substance that you probably can see, but you don't realize. So if you can see water that are brown, don't think that they are like dirty with minerals, but they're actually having dissolved organic substance. So, okay, they also move the same way. And uh, some other translocation agent also includes the organism, the animals or maybe the insects that are living on top of the soil surface. So this organism does not go too deep. They also, they, they they usually are like, located near the surface because only the surface have oxygen, so that's where you can find them. So they can move like, uh, vertically or maybe side by side, horizontally, depends on this organism. Okay, addition is, as you can see there, adding into the soil. How does it happen? A lot of, a lot of factors. Okay, number one, the most common addition comes from the organic matter because why? You have trees, right? So when trees grow on top, they probably from time to time they're going to deposit their dead leaves or maybe dead branches. So these are the organic material. But most of this plant, uh, this so-called addition happens from peat moss because earlier when you have minerals, most of the moss or in Barcelona you call it lumut, they grow on top and they die. So once they die, they don't go anywhere. So they keep on growing until one time that the parent material on top of it, there's a significantly thick layer of organic matter from those peat moss. So this is how soil is being formed. Yeah, at least by, 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 by peat moss. Yeah. And then slough off, uh, example, the other example is slough off or discarded as undesirable roots, the carbon having originated from the atmosphere. So this is very much like the addition from the input of organic matter from falling that, that that matters from the trees or, 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 or plants. Now that is because most of these material are organic and they are from carbon. And plants, they are made of from photosynthesis in which the major constituent carbon comes from carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So it's akin of the air, carbon dioxide, 
fixed enough that converts into solid organic matter and they keep building up onto the soil. In other words, this is how uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is being stored in the soil due to addition. Yeah? Or maybe even the dust particles that flies off from wind erosion and it falls out on the surface. This also can be counted as addition. I would say this addition is probably due to erosion process. Like they whip up by the strong wind and it falls down. So that is another example of wind erosion. Losses. So these losses are due to uh, some movement away from the soil profile. So these losses can be caused by uh, maybe evaporation from the plus due to loss of soil moisture because moisture here because it is part of the soil or maybe due to leaching and drainage. Now because some of the substances in the soil they may dissolve due to rainwater and they go deep or they go away horizontally along the layers of the soil. So these are the examples of like leaching or drainage. The, the major loss agent is erosion. So I would say erosion la, like the one that forms all those alluvial floodplains and also the uh, the 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 what alluvial fans these are the examples la, yeah the losses so it it, it it is mostly due to erosion like erosion by air or wind okay? now microbial deposition causes the loss of organic matter uh, and then the grazing of animals. So animals, when they graze, they carry away the organic matter. So that is one way how the components in soil are being lost. Okay, soil profile. So from this point onwards, I want you to like pay a lot of attention because there is a very simple reason to it because you will see in your tests and, and exams. Lah. Soil profile. In fact, this is the must know. Uh, you must know this. Lah. And whenever you learn fundamental, soil science. Now, what is soil profile? Now, soil profile is actually the uh, what, do you, what you can see layers after layers of a soil. When you dig deep enough, you're going to see these layers because after a certain and long time of weathering process, they will deposit differently. And due to the different nature of the soil components, the lighter ones will tend to stay on top and the heavier ones will tend to go deeper down. But you know the idea. Because of this nature, force of nature of weathering and also the physical and chemical attributes of this uh, weathered soil, they were going to form these different, different layers. And these different layers of soil, we call it soil profile. Okay. So, in terms of the soil horizons, what you're going to learn is uh, there will be six soil master horizon. There will be subdivision. This is where things get, I would say, challenging because why? If you have six master horizon to memorize, that is probably easy. But when you subdivide it into several smaller uh, thing or division from master horizon, it could be up to like thousands. So it's still not time yet, but I have to warn you, like, there is one chapter that talks about soil classification, and this is where we, we, we go details like, on how horizons are being subdivided based on their nature. Yeah, you can say this is the language of soil scientists. <clears throat> okay, now, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, there are six master horizons which are O, A, E, B, C, R. But let's look at the uh, the first horizon, which is O. O means organic, okay? And you can imagine that if the horizon have lot of organic matter, most likely is situated or located near the surface, which is true. So the first horizon nearer to the surface is O because they contain the most content of organic matter. Sometimes this O, this o horizon, you can see this organic matter is still being decomposed and you can see some strands from roots or maybe some uh, dead leaves are still being decomposed some are still fresh so these are part of the o horizon or maybe you can see some components from animals as well like dead insects dead animals things like that they count as the part of the o horizon 
So when you look at it, the old horizon in uh, in this soil profile is probably not that deep, and it should because why? Uh, when it goes deeper, it means the mineral phase, which is another thing. So the old horizon usually exists in the top 10 centimeters or top 20 centimeters, depending on what kind of soil that you have. Peat soil will have a bigger old horizon. So maybe this pot soil, this humic pot soil, having not much of the old horizon here. And for your information, most of the Malaysian soil, they're actually of pot soil, spodo soil, we call it. Because when you look around you, most of the soil in Malaysia are actually red or yellow. If it's red, and uh, it has a little bit of iron, but if we have less iron, they're actually yellow in color. So these are the most of the common soil in Malaysia. Lateritic soil, I think I will... Uh, Probably skip this one because when we talk about horizon, I will, I will tend to like elaborate A, B, and the rest of the master horizon first before I show you this one. Now, this is what we were about to learn when we come to that chapter about soil classification. So this is why I will skip this slide and wait until the, that, that lesson comes. Then I will elaborate later. Okay, next master horizon is A. Now, A is, is immediately under O horizon. But what is the difference? Then you can see like the A horizon also is equally dark or black in color. Now, the main difference between O and A horizon is that A horizon, they consist majority or primarily mineral. So most likely you're going to see sand. Now, I, I'm, I'm taking experience. Like you probably haven't dig a soil before, but once you dig, on the surface, you have a lot of coarse material, rocks, bigger ones. But if you dig deep enough, you're going to you're going to reach a layer or certain layer that you can see sand. So beginning from that area, beginning when you can see sand, that is considered that A horizon. And why they are black in color? Because this black color are due to the presence of organic matter that were deposited from the O horizon. Because if you if if you remember what I said earlier, weathering process we're going to transport, okay, water weathering process we're going to transport the dissolved organic matter from the O horizon downward to the A horizon. So they were actually from the O horizon. This black color, yeah, this organic material. So that's why they were trapped in the sand of the A horizon and it becomes black in color, yeah. But if you look further down, when it reaches to E horizon, they are actually like losing steam and they are like not transported further into the E horizon, which we're going to explain later. The E horizon, what you can see right here. So you can see that E horizon, usually they are not that black, not that black in color. Uh, that is because they don't have enough organic matter. But why? You see, when things going down, what goes down first is the heavier ones and the smaller particle. So these usually are minerals, small minerals such as clay or silt. So they will probably going to sink from the surface and most likely this E horizon comes from the A horizon as well because weathering transported them down. But in a certain layer, they stop moving and because they're so small, they stop water from transporting through, flow through them. Because clay are so small, they can actually stop water flow through them. And because of that, usually these clay particles, they don't store organic matter. You see? So that's why this E horizon, they exist either in the B, above B horizon, most likely in the above B horizon, like because they're clay, they stop the movement of water and they are very fine clay. So once again, if you dig deeper, you're probably going to see water first, and then this E horizon. These are usually clay, yeah? White colored clay. Uh, several years ago, I took students to, uh, to uh, Inda wetlands, in Inda, wet, uh, Inda wetlands in, in Dunkil. I asked them to dig and they managed to dig like waterways above their water and then E horizon. So they managed to dig onto E horizon. They did not actually dig deeper because sometimes uh, this clay, this clay layer can be quite thick up to half a meter 
maybe one feet or two feet. And it's quite hard to dig as well because they're so sticky. Yeah. Okay, moving on, next one. After the E horizon, you have B. So these are the uh, layers in which you have alluviation and accumulation of the parent material from above. So either you have uh, clay accumulated right here, but the distinctive difference is that they may also carry a certain characteristic, like they are red in color, sometimes red, sometimes whiter in color. Uh, that is because they have clay that have accumulated the ions from above. So you can see here the B horizon right here. And uh, most likely they're also quite fine in terms of the particle size, just like the E horizon. Um, so you know the idea, uh, these are usually the, this is where the, the clay particles stop and it carries a lot of uh, iron into it. Now the C and R horizon is the last two layers, last two horizons in the soil profile. These are the horizons where the weathering probably is not too extensive and you can see some parent material still intact, larger particles. And then the R horizon is the bedrock. Now bedrock is 100% rock. So these are the these these are the so-called the heavier rock or minerals that is not too uh, well developed and they usually located at the bottom. Okay, so very rarely last students and CareTech can can actually dig deep enough until you can reach C or R horizon because you really have to dig very deep, especially those uh, rocks or the soil profile that is very well developed. Now, we have like go through this uh, six master horizon. So in the next slide, we're going to learn about the transition horizon, which is between two uh, two master horizons. But I probably won't go into dwell too much of it for obvious reasons. If you know what I mean. If I don't explain too much, that means you don't need to like waste your time. Lah. So I skip. And I think this is the last slide of today's slide, the first slide. So as you can see right here, the subdivision, I call it. Master horizon, you have six to memorize. So go and memorize the, the six horizon, which is represented by the six alphabet. So once again, the top one starts with O. Next one, A, followed by E, followed by B horizon, and then C and R horizon. So you, you will have six master horizon, no matter what you are. So your question might be, is it possible that some soil have less than six horizon? The answer is yes. If you still remember the slides that we learned just now, some of the well-developed soil, they have all six horizon. If they are not well-developed, they maybe have less than that. So it can be, it is possible. Now, we don't have trouble with the uh, not so well-developed soil, but for the well-developed soil, I mean, there are a lot of things that we need to define. And to describe this different characteristic due to different conditions and different scenario, uh, different characteristic of this uh, weathering, they will be represented by these letters, the small letters. So just now the master horizon, they are capital letters, remember? Okay, in order to have the subdivision, usually they're paired with a small letter like this one, A, B, C, D, E, R, until now you can see that there are more letters coming in uh, but yeah, you know the idea that like most of these letters, they are used to define the differences, the small differences between this master horizon. And I know you, you can't memorize all these things. Even I myself also, I don't memorize. So, but unfortunately, like, you're going to see some of this question from this subdivision. The small alphabets, I'm probably going to ask you what that means. Um, but here's a, here's a tips. I'm going to give you a tips. If there is in the question in test and exam that you're going to be asked about this subdivision, most likely this subdivision is the most applicable ones in Malaysia. In which I'll explain again, again and again. So you you can guess lah. If I speak too many times of that subdivision, you can guess in final exam you're going to see it. Okay, enough said. 